Welcome to the Healers Cafe, conversations on health and healing with Mano Belize, a retired and deregistered naturopathic physician with 30 plus years of experience. Here you will discover engaging and informative conversations between experienced healers, covering all aspects of healing, the personal journey, the journey of the practitioner, and the amazing possibilities for our own body and spirit. So welcome to the Healers Cafe. And today I have with me Dr. Sarah Marshall. She's a naturopathic doctor. She's a speaker, author, and host of a podcast called Heal. And she has practiced as a naturopathic physician and business consultant in international telemedicine practice for over 14 years. Sarah's calling for her life is people are free and connected to the divine and she has built her practice to activate and amplify our innate ability to heal now she focuses um, on food as medicine activation of the immune system hormone balance mental emotional peace and well all kinds of um, chronic diseases that um, yeah, that there's solutions for. So I really wanted to welcome you uh, on on this um, show. And yeah, and let's, let's take it from there. I mean, actually, my first question to you, how did you get interested in this field? Oh, my gosh. Um, thank you so much for having me. It's really awesome to be here. It's great to be on this side of the microphone. It's really fun. <laughs> Um, how I got interested in this. So I am going to just dive in with that. When I was a very young child, um, there was a just sort of sense of my innate intuition. And I had really open minded, I jokingly, lovingly say I was raised by hippies, like I was raised by wolves, my parents met on a commune, and I had a very eclectic upbringing. But the, one of the wonderful things about that was, you know, I was really free to be myself. And so there was sort of this innate sense of intuition. Um, one of my favorite family stories was I was at preschool and it was the middle of the day and it was not at all time to be picked up. And I started gathering my things and putting my boots and my jacket on. And my teacher came over and was like, Sarah, it's not time to go yet. Like, you're going to be here a while. And I was like, no, my mom's on her. Like, my mom's coming. My mom's coming. And she's like, no, she's not. And then two minutes later, my mom walked in the door and had to come grab me early. And so, you know, that's a little anecdote, but there was a lot of experiences like that when I was young. And I also had my first asthma attack when I was nine months old. They didn't know it was asthma because I was nonverbal at that point. It was pre-verbal. And by the time I was 18 months old, they finally figured out that's what had been going on. I was, you know, that's a pretty young age to be diagnosed with asthma. Um, I had a round with mononucleosis that hospitalized me when I was 13 years old. I had my tonsils and adenoids taken out after I ended up with antibiotic resistant strep throat when I was 18 years old. There was a whole series of health challenges. And again, my parents were so awesome. At, like I saw a homeopathic doctor when I was um, eight, nine and 10 years old before they got kicked out of New York and were no longer allowed to practice. And those were the only two, two and a half years that I basically had completely controlled asthma. And while we would have me on, you know, inhalers, my mom was adamant to not have me on steroids, which I'm grateful for. And we would do as much as we could. Also, when I'd be in the middle of an attack, she'd take me outside into the cold night air and we would use herbal baths. And quite frankly, I wore malachite around my neck to open up my lungs and my heart chakra. And so like I had my feet kind of in both worlds throughout my childhood. And the thing that always struck me was at no point did any doctor say, when you're not having asthma, here's what you can do to heal your lungs. Right. In between attacks, this is what you could do to like improve your health. There was no conversation. And even then that was weird to me. And I did notice we were required in New York state to take swimming class in high school, which everybody hated because you had to get your hair wet and you're in high school and your makeup and your hair is ruined and all that. I figured out my freshman year that when I took swim class over the winter, I had less asthma attacks. 
And Mm -hmm. so I started swimming routinely through the winter and it helped my breathing because I was basically doing breathing exercises, which Mm -hmm. I now can see. But at the time it was like, you know, there was this strengthening that was happening. And so there were these pieces that started to come together. And then my undergraduate was in in chemistry. And I always thought the human body is like the ultimate chemistry set. Mm-hmm. And so I started messing with my nutrition and I would try all these crazy diets. I did a diet that was called chronobiotic nutrition, where you ate certain things at certain times during the day based on when the sunlight hit them. Like, I mean, I was just going for it. I would try all sorts of things and I was always hanging out in the nutrition, but also metaphysical sections of the bookstores back when we went to bookstores. So that was all there for me. But what was interesting is I had never heard of a naturopathic physician. Mm. I actually didn't know our profession existed. I didn't know that there was such a thing as a medically trained, licensed practitioner who also specialized in homeopathy and herbal medicine and nutrition. And I um, saw a advertisement in a magazine that literally said, you will be a naturopathic doctor. (laughs) Now, I don't actually know if that's what the advertisement said or not. Like that literally was like what happened. And I was like, what the heck is a naturopathic doctor? And I Googled it and looked it up and found the accredited association of naturopathic physicians and the schools that were related to it. And within like days was downloading applications and applying to medical school because I had just finished my undergraduate. So that was a lot of the process that brought me. And when I read, there's a page in that um, website that has the tenets of naturopathic medicine. There's six kind of coded tenets. And it was like reading a page out of my own journal. It was so in alignment, you know, of the healing power of nature and treating the root cause and, you know, truly physician do no harm as much as naturally possible. And um, doctor is teacher and, you know, the, the, just the innate vital force that lives inside of all of us that can actually be opened up to heal. And I was 25 years old at the time. Like there was some ancient wisdom that was coming through me. And I feel like I'm free to share this here that, I'm quite certain I've been a medicine woman for a long time and that something ancient, whether it's past lives or if it's just the collective consciousness that comes through me, there's something that um, was already alive in me and this was just the right fit to take on this profession. I truly thought I was going to the Hogwarts of medicine though and I had some disappointments when I got to medical school and it was like way more about conventional medicine than I expected it to be. And so I had to go through, that's a whole nother part of the story, but um, that's essentially what led me to naturopathic medicine. Wow. (laughs) Again, you know, no coincidences, right? (laughs) Nope. (laughs) Yeah. So, I mean, it's interesting because you, you've been in practice 15 years, right? Yeah. And that's about when I think the, as a profession, the naturopathic profession wanted to look more and more like the what we call the allopathic profession the conventional drug therapy but I I wonder you know because I've always said and I'm just thinking out loud here (laughs) but that's what this podcast is (laughs) but but it's like I've always thought oh it, it comes from this lack from this idea that we're not good enough with what we have and that, therefore, we need to, like, copy um, medical doctors. But now, having gone through the last three years, like everyone else, I'm thinking, you know, and then there was the Carnegie Report and all this, which predates it ages ago. But I wonder if it wasn't very well orchestrated, if if it wasn't really about the the takeover of a profession that really could help people heal. What are your thoughts on that? <laughs> oh man. <laughs> you know, I I personally just choose I this is a choice, right? Like I choose to live in a world view that people are not inherently malicious like mm-hmm. on purpose. Mm-hmm. I think that there's um we as human beings are are hardwired to acceptance and belonging. It's an innate 
like every infant has to have this connection to their family members. And many of us, and we can go into the world of trauma and what we've learned about when those connections get not well fed or broken due to whatever circumstances that happen in our childhood where we don't actually experience belonging. We don't experience being loved and nourished and accepted the way that we are. And this is my spiritual view and also somewhat my psychology informed view that those traumatized humans grow up to be politicians (laughs) and they grow up to make decisions about the world and that there's a lot of things that get determined based on human beings right now are expressing that it's more important to try and belong to a club than it is to follow along with an innate wisdom or what actually is in the best interest of the planet and the people. And so a lot of decisions are being made based on who are they going to win favor with And how are they going to be funded, which is also just a metric of winning favor, and who will they upset, and they're not willing to be courageous and stand out to upset the apple cart so they stay safe. So Mm -hmm. is it absolutely possible that there's something more orchestrated here? Completely. My personal worldview is if you want to know, just follow the money. It probably is something in the realm of defunding or overfunding or whatever that kind of is. Um, You certainly can't say that what we would deem complementary alternative medicine, I just call it medicine, um, is not a source of profit as, you know, supplements in the well-being industry is like one of the largest multi-trillion dollar businesses in the world. So that doesn't totally add up, but I, I can't really speak to having a lot of education about it, but it's definitely interesting to see even inside of our own profession, there are factions and there are groups of people who would prefer like, you know, I'm I'm a part of the Utah um, Association of Naturopathic Physicians. And there's a lot of conversations that come up regularly about expanding our formulary, which is the law that tells us what we can and can't prescribe, specifically what pharmaceuticals we can and can't prescribe. And it seems like there's an essence of even some, and I'm really going out on a limb here. So here we go, that there's people in our own profession that also have those wounds and those traumas such that it's important for them to prove themselves. And the only way that we can prove that we're real doctors is if we have the scope of practice of a standard conventional doctor Mm -hmm. and that that becomes more important to legitimize our medicine because we can prescribe all these drugs where to me, it's like, we're measuring the wrong thing. We legitimize our medicine by the state of health of our patients. Yes. You know, is it working? Are they healthier? Are they better? And if you want to play those statistics, I know there was a survey done. I don't know that it was published, but there was a couple naturopaths who surveyed a very large amount of naturopathic physicians through the pandemic. And there was not a single death from COVID of any of our patients. Mm. Not one. And just that statistic alone, if we want to put up the conventional allopathic model and the naturopath, and of course, these are not surveys that are being done. These are not research that's actually getting enacted to actually look at like, if I want to hire two financial advisors, I want to know what their track record is. But when we hire doctors, which most people don't even think about it that way, what's their statistical track record? Like, like, would you ever go with a real estate agent that failed at sa- selling 75% of the houses they ever went, you know, worked with? Like, but we don't have those kind of statistics for medicine. Hmm. Yeah. No. There's my, there's a soapbox for you. <laughs> good, good points. You know, cause I was thinking, um, and it's a bit different here in BC, we have prescription rights. And I was thinking, hmm, that's about when things changed, you know, and, and I'm thinking on what you've just said, it's like, yeah, that it changes who wants to come, who wants to learn and sort of the, you know, the child inside that needs to heal. It, it, it it attracts a different, you know, different people than, um, than 30 years ago, for example. Right. So it's, it's interesting how all that works. And, and I agree. I mean, you know, you you can follow the money trail for sure. You can go, well, hmm, interesting, you know, um, pharmaceuticals. Okay, well, who, who gains from us using pharmaceuticals? Yeah. You can also go, hmm, interesting. 
why is it we're just about to lose 80% of all natural products in Canada? Right? Because it's a big yeah. industry. It makes tons of money. Why are we losing? Yeah, that brings a whole different set of questions up. Yeah. <laughs> certainly does you know and then you go huh it's interesting so what is the plan about all all that you know and and i'm not trying to reduce our our wonderful conversation to these thoughts but but it, you know a lot of naturopaths in canada are wondering what are they going to do when they can't access and the patients can't pay for um the um the supplements that they might actually need even for, for a temporary time. So this is an interesting, so I thought I was going to live in the Netherlands long-term. I moved there briefly and the medical landscape in the Netherlands is very different than the United States. And there's almost no herbal medicine and supplements available. It's very limited. I mean, you can get 15 or 20 different herbs and you can get 15 or 20 basic, you know, vitamin C, vitamin B, zinc, iron, but there's not at all anything like the pharmacopoeia that we have of yep. um, options. Right. And I really was looking at, okay, I'm still committed to healing and to assisting people. And that's actually where I leaned very heavily into I would bring my homeopathic mother tinctures. <laughs> I would work with flower essences and I would practice energy work and, and food as medicine. Like I, I started to just look like there's, there's a fear of what's happening in the censorship of natural medicine. Absolutely. There's a concern for that and the limiting anywhere when we're limiting human freedom, I have concern and a lot of questions. Then there's this other place though, where it's interesting what you said about the point that our profession possibly took a big turn is when we actually started to get prescribing rights for pharmaceuticals. And I see this in the younger generation of, of the new naturopaths. They tend to fall back on and rely on pharmaceuticals. They like prescribe way more pharmaceutical. I, I basically don't prescribe at all uh, pharmaceuticals, but it, a lot of that I find comes from a place of they don't actually trust the natural right. medicine. They haven't seen it work. They haven't actually been trained in such a way to see the ease and the beauty and the possibility and also the longevity because some things in naturopathic medicine takes time to unwind and, and we don't have our schools set up to actually get us that information. It, it wasn't that way when I was there. If I had only stayed inside of the conventional education, the standard education model, and I hadn't taken seminars every single weekend with doctors outside of my standard education, I probably would have felt the same way. But I went and sought out practitioners who were doing work that I saw was working. And I got to witness the right. miracle of natural medicine through homeopathy, through physical therapies, through, you know, all sorts of different modalities. So I got to be one of the ones that came out with a solid belief and and experience of what's actually possible in our medicine. And I see in many of our younger, you know, the the doctors that have been graduating since I graduated, that's not there. And and so then all they think is like, okay, well, I'm gonna, you know, low dose naltrexone and I'm gonna keep them on the, you know, the standards and the still prescribe antibiotics and and hormone replacement therapy, which is another whole that could be a podcast in and of itself. Yep. Um, you know, all those things. So mm -hmm. I'm gonna pause there because yeah. What would your life be like if you were pain free? If you were one of the millions who suffer from chronic pain, the thought of just one day without it may seem impossible. This is often because conventional medicine tends to fall short in the treatment of pain. Opting to prescribe pills or recommend surgery rather than getting to the root cause of the problem. But if you are suffering with emotional or physical pain, there is hope. Join the founder and CEO of Bowen College, Manol Boliger, live online for your body-mind reboot. Learn how to listen to your symptoms and get to the root cause of your pain. Plus, be trained in basic Bowen therapy moves so that you can reboot your body for optimal health. You don't have to live in pain. You can heal. Stop the pain pill cycle by visiting www.yourbodymindreboot.com to learn more and to register.
Yeah, no, but you, you raise really important um, points is that if, you know, the uh, traditionally we learned from watching others practice, right? And now we're in a school and a school always teaches a certain way, whatever it is, it'll go kind of with the culture and the times and the financing and you know, I mean, we've seen how it changes our school systems. I mean, just look at our general kids' school systems. What's what's happening there? It's shocking, right? It's so, you know, it's not surprising that um, that it, what we hold to, what we really want to learn, because intuitively we have seen or we know, we've experienced. When that's what we want to learn, it's not what's being taught now officially in naturopathic schools and that's why so many of them you know in the last little period of time where we lost 8,000 healthcare workers in BC um, <clears throat> you know they're like well maybe maybe I really wasn't fit to be a whatever it is because they don't have the confidence in it and, you know, I've had so many in the past when I had a practice, I had so many medical doctors come in and say they just feel like they're drug peddlers now. You know, they don't. They were saying, oh, you're so lucky to be able to choose the, the appropriate medicine and to actually work with the body. And I'm like, wow, you know, <laughs> it's like almost flip around. Right. But I yeah. think we're, we're at a stage now where um it is going to be our own path. It's going to be what we what we choose to bring into our field, into what we want to learn, you know. And I think, like you, like you did, you you took seminars every weekend, right? I think that's kind of what matters more now than the labels that people have, because you can't know you can't know anymore. What does a naturopath know if you try and refer to a naturopath i mean there's no such it's like <laughs> it it's a broad be, range a yeah. broad range i mean they're, yeah. they're all medically trained okay that is in common but that's not why people necessarily go you know they really want solutions that don't have detrimental impacts right so yeah, it's it's going to be very interesting whether our profession will survive these times and maybe grow into like I know here there's like parallel societies being built um, that are really interested in providing true care. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a, it's shocking. It's like, oh my goodness, that happened so fast, you know. It's fascinating. But, yeah, yeah, it's fascinating, you know, so it is your journey ultimately, right? What you bring in, what you connect with, you know, and, and you brought up intuition mm -hmm. um, and, and the word divine in both your statements twice now. <laughs> so why don't we explore that? <laughs> what would you like to know? Cause there's a lot there. <laughs> well, no, but how does that yeah. play in for you? Like, you know, cause it, it's very not common, but in the healing community, a lot of people, you know, have experienced intuition at some point in their life. And then they've either suppressed it fully or learned not to believe it. And then later they've come back to it. And I think divine is a little bit the same way. It, it almost feels to me like they're, they're almost similar processes. And so I'm just curious <laughs> how you're looking at this <laughs> so there yeah there's a lot of things I could say about it I I actually want to speak to the divine because that that word's riskier for me I think okay. than intuition I think we've come to a certain place where we're even honoring and respecting not universally but the conversation is present that intuition makes a difference for medical doctors and for nurse practitioners and for nurses and that that there is actually a role for our heart, I would call it heart centered, um, instincts to play in healing and the care of others. And then the divine that throws people a little bit further for a loop, you know, and, and it's really, it's non-religious for me, but I, I looked at a lot of different words 
and you could say spiritual or spirit or energy. And definitely I would say there's a lot of interchange, but it's like energy is very broad and, and generalized and can refer to lots of things. And then spirit and spirituality kind of hones in, but there's something about the word divine that is very powerful and it connects us to something ineffable that I'm now going to try and talk about the thing that you can't talk about, <laughs> but it's, you know, it's about, for me, you know, I say that the reason for my existence, that the whole purpose of my life and why I'm here is to support myself and others in, you know, being free and being connected to the divine. And I could even say being the divine, but that would be even more risky. Um, I think it's our innate nature of who we are and what we're here for. I think it's a recognition that there's something bigger than just our molecules and our body parts, something that is, we, you know, a, a frequency or a vibration or a force inside of us that says, this is the experience of life I want to have. This is the kind of version of Julie I want to be. This is the kind of Matthew that I want to express, you know, and, and that there's this amazing opportunity as being a human being as a unique species on this planet to get to change our minds and do different things and create and create again and and have our hearts broken and discover courage to love again and and all of these experiences that we have as human beings and for me there's some i know this is a podcast you can't see me but it's like there's something channeling through from the top of our heads into our bodies that is like wanting to be expressed and and that when we disconnect from that or we deny that or we pretend it's not there or we're numb to it is a source of dis-ease. I actually think it's one of the ultimate sources of dis-ease. And part of how I came to that is being with people over the last 15 years, 20 years really, and standing for their healing and watching them do their own healing work everybody comes to the same place, which is as their body repairs itself and as they get freed up from pain and from some of their symptoms and suffering, they start asking these questions. Who am I? What am I here for? And what do I want my life to be about? And that's not just even in physical, that's in therapy, that's in like, I've been a part of personal growth and transformational coaching programs. And when you free people up from their trauma, when they wake up out of the suffering they've been in, it's universal. People start asking the question about their purpose. For me, I connect that to something like you could use the word divine, you know, but whatever people are comfortable with. And I think that if we quite frankly want to speed up the process of healing is to just get honest faster about what we're really here to do. Yeah. I can take the slow road and we can talk about, you know, vegetables and not cooking with bad oils. And that's great. That's useful. And I do that. But like, we could also cut to the chase and say, what is your life for? And what are you here for? And what really matters to you? And then what do you need your body to be and do so that you can fulfill on that? Now here's the diet for you, right? Based on that. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's, um, yeah, that's funny. I, I no, I totally agree. And, and one of the questions I ask people, and I, I realize I've just put it together with you. What you just said is, um, why is it you want to heal? Like, you know, so they have knee pain. Why? Why does it matter that you heal the knee pain? And that just opens up the dialogue. It's it's like, it's the fast way. But once they're aligned to the why they, they want it, whether it's to be able to run after their grandkids or whatever the story might be. But once they have something bigger than the the understanding that, mechanically this is wrong this knee should work and now we're going to make it work you know once we're past that we are into that field immediately yeah. you know and then to just close the loop you asked about intuition i would say that one way of looking at intuition is it is your opportunity to hear the language of the divine you yeah. know, and that that's a whole skill set. I truly believe everyone is intuitive. I think it's a part of our innate human being. I think that there's whole levels of our body and our physiology that we have not yet, you know, we didn't know the immune system existed not that many decades ago and we right. barely understood. And now we have this whole map of cytokines and all the different types of T cells and B cells and, you know, pathways of immunity. 
it's it's going to be the same thing as we branch further into the energetic body that we're just starting to get language around the frequencies and and there's aspects of that that have been we've tapped into for thousands of years of ancient medicine through shamanism and chinese medicine and ayurvedic medicine that we're already working in alignment with what in our medicine we call the vital force but i think it's even more than that and when you partner with that divinity healing is very fast and and it's amazing what the body's capable of and so for me intuition is like the coding or the language or the way to start to get access to that just from something as simple as a gut feeling do i actually want to go to the baseball game or do i really want to stay home and watch a movie and asking the question what is in my highest and best interest you know how you phrase the question makes a really big difference but then from there you know you can go way deep and i do intuitive medical readings with some of my clients that request it. I also am firmly rooted in, here's the medical scientific answer. Here's the diagnostic information I'm trained in. I want you to have all of that. But if you're open, we can also have a conversation to access something that might go beyond what the labs can show us. Mm -hmm. And I hold it as that. I hold it as just, this is not, I don't, I don't think it's like the answer, but it brings in a level of, um, that person often feels very witnessed and seen. And it's like, there's a place in their heart that goes, oh my gosh, yes, this is what I've been waiting for a healthcare practitioner to say back to me. I knew there was more to it than just my antibodies are doing this and my blood cells are doing that, right? It tends to speak to people in a in that like innate knowing place. So I bridge the two together in my practice. Mm, wow, that's, I mean, it's so exciting. <laughs> That there, that there are naturopaths doing this. <laughs> we still exist. We're still out there. Uh, yeah. No, it's, yeah. It, but I mean, that's the thing. What, why, why wouldn't we, mm -hmm. you know, why wouldn't we make it easier, <laughs> you know, and in, and in their language, right? Like when, when you're saying, you know, in, intuition, let, let's let's cut this a little bit more detail here are you do you feel that it's a process of you seeing them and their story and then something is guided for you to say well for example was it was there a grief that happened or a, like is it like a a very open questioning process or do you feel that they're in a state of opening and like how, how do you see that that this information comes to you is what I'm trying yeah. to <laughs> oh my gosh I mean I think it's I think it's in the in-between I think it's both and I think that it's um it's recognizing the inner resonance between both me and that other person and so um, I used to do readings where I was like, here's what I see. I right. actually don't do that anymore. I may pick it back up again, which is interesting, but um, I've mostly shifted into inquiry. And so my intuition guides me a lot on what questions to ask. What's way more interesting to me is their answer than whatever my version of interpreting the imagery or whatever I see. So a lot of my intuition in my practice on a regular basis is just guiding me what questions to ask when and how, and then how to respond to whatever they may be dealing with in that moment. I trust my just instincts and how I respond to them. Because a lot of my work is done in conversation. I It's like my therapy. I'm not hands-on in that way. I'm word-on. Yeah. <laughs> so I do a lot through communication. And yeah. it's all over my astrological, astrological charts that communication is one of my healing gifts. But I also have a very concrete way that I do a roadmap where I have built a spreadsheet. And it's bi binomial, it's yeses and nos. And I have a whole diagnostic list of, of options and things that might be going on with this person. And I also look at their Chinese um, five element theory and I will look at their seven chakras. And it's like reading an, uh, an intuitive MRI. And I take that information and share it with them in the context that this is intuitive and it's non-diagnostic and it's just for their information and they should keep whatever resonates and anything I say that doesn't make any sense to them, just toss it. 
But what happens is it starts to, that's that place where one of the aspects of healing, I think that's really important is when we're fully heard and seen. And I actually believe when you feel an experience being fully heard and seen, energy leaves your body. Like trauma can come out of your body. You can actually release things mm -hmm. that have been trapped. And I've found that doing those medical assessment, medical intuitive assessments that way, for many of my clients, they have this deep sigh of like relief and this breath leaves and they're just, I mean, oftentimes they cry because for many people, they've suffered a lot of medical trauma and yeah. they've been to many, many, many doctors and specialists and they start to feel crazy and there's all sorts of things they're dealing with. So there's a piece of it that is very mechanical, like yes, no answers. Where's the source of inflammation? Is the hippocampus involved? Is it a testosterone issue? Are there heavy metals? Might there be hidden viral infections? And it's, I don't even know, is it pure intuition or is it me organizing my thoughts? I don't care. <laughs> and it's how it's useful. And sometimes it points me diagnostically to run tests that I wouldn't have gotten to that test as quickly, yeah. but it's just screaming off the page that we should do heavy metal testing. And I'm like, look, here's what I'm thinking. How do you feel about this? But then I let them come into their own resonance and agreement with that versus me being like, this is what we have to do. I don't, I don't do any of that in my practice. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm going to leave it at that, but that uh -huh. is a whole conversation. I'd love to. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, thank you, uh, Sarah, so much for sharing, you know, your your wisdom and your um, your energy. <laughs> it's great to be here. Part of um, what what profession I think, you know, has still the potential of being an amazing uh, profession. Yeah, yeah. Very powerful healers for sure. I'm grateful to know another one in you as well. <laughs> Thank you for joining well, us thank you at the coming. Healers Cafe with Dr. Mano. Thank you for joining us at the Healers Cafe with Mano Belize. Continue your healing journey by visiting thehealerscafe.com and her website and discover how to listen to your body and reboot for optimal health.